Welcome to this analysis of the nymph's reply to the shepherd by Sir Walter Raleigh. In this poem, we need to say that this is an anti-pastoral poem. Unlike the shepherd's poem, which is pastoral, this poem does not idealize life on the countryside. It actually does the opposite. It shows that that life has got some challenges and it has some weaknesses that the shepherd did not actually mention. So as the title suggests, the speaker is the nymph and it is actually a reply to the shepherd. And here, just like in the passionate shepherd, the nymph is using um, the first person point of view, or rather the poet decides to use the first person point of view whereby we have I and me pronouns to indicate the speaker is in the first person. Um, this poem equally has rhyme. Uh, it has a regular rhyme scheme. Every stanza has four lines, which we call quatrains. Uh, every two lines, or rather the couplets have the same rhyme, and they actually use the same sound at the end. So we have a rhyme scheme here, which is AA for the first two sounds, BB for the next, and for the second stanza, it continues to C, C, D, D, and so on. So you can equally find the rhyme for the whole poem using that pattern. The poem has a refrain, that line that is repeated and can be used actually to judge whether the poem has a certain theme that is indicated within the lines. We have the line, to live with thee and be thy love. This line is repeated in line 4, line 20 and line 24. It actually guides us on what the theme of this poem is and it gives us a clue that this poem is about to talk about love. On tone, this nymph is very realistic, and so we say that the tone of this poem is realistic. Now, moving on to the stanza by stanza analysis. In the first stanza, we see that here, the nymph is replying to the shepherd's request, and she actually dismisses what he has offered. She doesn't think these gifts are very promising, and so she thinks these are petty pleasures. She says that this possibly could sway her only if she lived in a perfect world without any worries and if everything was perfect in her world then she would actually accept of course we understand this she means that no because she actually doesn't live in a perfect world on to the second stanza here the speaker describes how time changes and how the natural world will of course change with the seasons and she reminds the shepherd that actually there will be times that he will actually need to follow up on his duties. He will have work. So in as much as he tries to paint in her world that they will just sit and watch and enjoy life, she wants him to remember that he actually has duty, like driving the flocks to the fold back. And here, a very interesting inclusion of Greek mythology. This is an allusion whereby she mentions Philomel, or you can also say Philomela, which is a character in Greek mythology where she was turned into a bird. So when this line mentions Philomel, uh, we understand that it means that the birds will no longer be singing because in the Greek mythology, Philomel became dumb. So the birds will no longer be singing just like the shepherd would like the nymph to believe that the birds will always be singing. Now, in the third stanza, she continues to describe the effects of time. And by living in the natural world, she suggests that there will be winter. And so all those beautiful looking fields are going to dry up and there won't be a chance to enjoy the view. She argues that while all these things may be, you know, as desirable as the shepherd wants them to be, they are of little use because hard times are coming. And she uses the line honey tongue. Here, it means that whatever words that he has used, which are very sweet words, just like a honey tongue, this is not going to be a real situation when it comes to fall 
because it's going to be a sad situation whereby the heart or at that moment whatever words that he used very fancifully just like the fanciful mm -hmm. spring this will be very hurtful moments and very bitter moments when it comes to fall that these words that are very sweet to her at this point later on when the seasons are no longer like that it's going to be a very bitter moment for her in the fourth stanza here she is listing the things that were offered to her and she sort of dismisses them indicating that of course they are gifts yes but they are not of any practical use to her in the fifth stanza, the speaker lists yet another set of the examples of gifts that the shepherd promised to give, but she indicates here that these are not enough uh, to sway her so that she can move and be with the shepherd. She denies that it is not so powerful to have these things, so she sort of doesn't think that she needs to move and live with the shepherd. On to the last stanza, at this very end, uh, the speaker concedes again or accepts in a way that uh, she would only come and uh, live with the shepherd if the world she is living in was perfect, she would actually accept. And that's well, if youth lasts forever, you know, if love still breeds, if love is a permanent thing and always breeds at all seasons and all times, and if youth doesn't, you know, doesn't cease or doesn't end, there is no end to being young, then she's willing to come and live with the shepherd. Once again, we use this line to understand that her response, unfortunately, to the shepherd, she has said no to the request and she will not be going to live with the shepherd. And coming to that, that is the end of the line by line explanation of the name's reply to the shepherd. Thank you.